want to salute the people from California. Ray, I didn't know he'd remember me because he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, but he's down to earth. Our beloved Kamala Harris, we're so proud of her. She just worked herself to death to become the Attorney General when all over the state was against the death penalty and still won. Very cool, very cool. Richard, I, we were on the meadows together at Northwestern, shutting down Sheridan Road. I think the statute of limitations has run. And Sean has saw the gorilla the first time uh, he saw the video, so glad to know you. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I went to school up the road in Evanston. Um, Jean, Jack Hines, who's here, who's one of my heroes, uh, started desegregating the student body at Northwestern. A lot of Jews were not allowed to come to Northwestern. There were very few black students. So he admitted us all. We then started taking over buildings and shutting down highways. So he kind of <laughs> rethought thought his point of view. My first day at Northwestern, I went to my dorm room, and it, it was a triplex. And there was a woman there from California bushy hair. I ended up in California. I love California. But then the third person walked in, a blonde person. I used to have blonde streaks, so it's nothing against blonde people. But she took one look at me, uh, left, spent the night in a hotel, and then got a single down the, the hall later on. That was my welcome to Northwestern. Um, I entered Northwestern supporting the war. Uh, by the spring, I was taking over buildings. By the summer, I was tear gassed at the Democratic Convention. Um, by uh, junior year, I was on the moratorium on Washington, was against the war, debated Vice President Agnew when they started the 1970 Southern strategy. So Dean Hines, thank you for a wonderful education. Um, when I started at Northwestern, I wanted to be a psychologist. I really wanted to be a talk therapist, talk, uh, saw myself as a black female, Sigmund Freud. But at Northwestern, they did in, um, can you hear me? Uh, experimental work with rats and mazes, and that wasn't what I had in mind at all. So I switched to um, political science and history and taking over buildings um, and became a constitutional lawyer. But my life has come full circle because psychology has become a very important part of what I do. I now think about MRIs, amygdalas, synaps synapses, and the like. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, Mazarin Banaji, and others have popularized a concept of implicit bias, unconscious bias, and the like. Now, normally, I would give this talk, and it would last an hour, and I would do it with a cognitive neuroscientist. I just love that term. However, the people here are very ruthless. I've been told that there's a trap door here, <laughs> and if we go over 15 minutes, we're off the stage. I was a magna cum laude graduate of the uh, Fidel Castro School of Public Speaking, so having to talk in 15 minutes is very, very difficult, but I don't want to go down to the basement. So what I've got to do is condense an hour's worth of information into 15 minutes. What I want to do is give you a number of snapshots. I also want to call upon the notion of impressionistic, uh, impressionistic painting. You know, if you go to the Art Institute, you'll see some of the impressionists, and you'll go up and you'll see just these blobs of paint. And then you stand back from them and you let your eye and your mind kind of go over the blobs of paint and you see water lilies or a field. So that's what I want to do with you all today. I want to throw some ideas out your way and then I want to stand back and kind of tell you what I'm seeing. So the gorilla, I love that experiment. There's another version of that where a woman walks across the stage very slowly with an umbrella. You don't see her because you're, you've been asked to focus on passing the basketball back and forth. So that's what you do. So something that is clearly on the screen that you saw, you did not see. This is a very important concept to keep in mind as I go forward. Now, I'm a constitutional lawyer. I'm not a scientist. But I've worked with scientists on coming up with some of these concepts. And what I have learned is that we are hardwired to deal with a whole lot of information that's coming at us all the time, billions of bits of information. We don't have the time to actually stop and process the information, so we've got to make quick decisions, quick judgments, process information. People have said to me, it goes back to uh, the time when we were cavemen and cave women, and we're walking along and we see something coming towards us. Is it Uncle Leo or is it a saber-toothed tiger? You don't have time to sit down and go, hmm, hmm, hmm. You've got to make that decision right away. And that's how we're hardwired, to process information and make decisions very quickly. We make shortcuts. We have uh, 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 deal with stereotypes. Now, I'm going to uh, confess something to you. Several years ago, there was, a, there was a hurricane in the southern part of the state uh, country. And they were talking about looters. 
When I heard the word looter, what came to my mind was an African American. Now when I have more time to talk, I ask people in the audience, how many of you have had experiences with this? Well, once a civil rights lawyer says that she's thought of looters when she hears, um, uh, or black people when she hears looters, all the hands go up and there's a little bit too much oversharing of people <laughs> telling all the times when they've had that experience. But what's important to understand is that we all have these reactions. There's no shame in it, and we need to deal with it, and we need to figure out how to get over it, but we need to acknowledge it in a safe environment. And I hope that's what we can do today. Now there, I talk about, uh, there's something called implicit associations. What do we make connections between? Me, looters, black people. The social science seems to indicate that people connect blacks with crime and aggression. And this is something that's in people's minds, and obviously it has implications for how we deal uh, in the criminal justice setting. Professor Jennifer Eberhardt at Stanford has also done um, groundbreaking uh, research showing that many people uh, associate black people and apes. If you've looked at any of the despicable uh, things that have been posted online about our president and the first lady, you'll see often their faces are grafted onto apes, and this is because people have this um, uh, connection. Now, I'm going to show you something now that's a little bit disturbing, and it's not going to stay up there very long. But when people see my face or see some of the faces of the black people in this audience, the part of their brain that lights up is the part of the brain that lights up when they see these images. The amygdala lights up when you see my face in the same way that it lights up when you see this. Now, I didn't want to have you guys freaked out for the next 10 minutes. so. <laughs> I thought I'd have kind of a consciousness palette cleanser by having this cute little puppy up there. Some of you, when they see you, they see puppies. That's not what they see when they see me. And it's one of the disturbing things about this whole um, uh, area of ideas is you're walking down the street and you know this is how people react to you. Talk to black men about how they're reacted to. They know this. They know this. Uh, there's a crazy comedian named Cat Williams. His his. <laughs> Some of you know Cat. Um, he's strange, uh, but very funny. But he talks to bl black people and he says, you know when you come upon a, a white person who doesn't like you and they get that look on their face like they have the stomach flu? Many of, and some of the black people in this room can tell you that this is happening. People are kind of flinching when they see you. This goes on all the time and it goes back, and I won't show you the snake and the spider again, but it goes back to that. Let me talk about how this plays out in another area. There's a groundbreaking study called Can Jamal and Lakeisha, are they as employable as Brandon and Emily? What was done is that you had similar resumes. You put black sounding names at the top of one set of resumes, white sounding names at the top of the other, black, white. The black sounding names at the top of the resumes were called back two thirds fewer times than the white sounding names. When you increase the qualifications of the black sounding named resumes, the white people still got a leg up. If you ask those decision makers, were they racist and are they racist, they would say absolutely not and they would believe it and it would be true. Yet there's something going on in their minds about connotations of black people and lack of intellectual ability that has them making those judgments. This goes on all the time, every day. Now here's another thing I want to show you. Um, although the producer, the people here are just too smart. I show these people stuff, they go, no, I didn't see that at all. So you be quiet, producer. Okay, look at these faces. As you go from right to left, the features become increasingly more African. Broader nose, thicker lips. <coughs> now most people when they see the face on the far left think that the skin color is darker. Do you see that the skin color is darker there? <coughs> he didn't. It's exactly the same color. There's no gradation in the skin colors. I've looked at this slide over and over and over, and I swear that this brother is darker than this brother, but in reality, the skin color is exactly the same. But look what your eye might do as the features become increasingly more African. The last example I'll give you is this. <clears throat> There's a video, and if I had an hour, I would show it, but, uh, and some of you may have seen it on 2020. There's a, a simulation with three different people. There's a park, there's a bike, and somebody is stealing the bike. They're using clippers to steal the bike. The first person is white. 
people in the uh, park come up and say, what are you doing? Is that your bike? No, that's not my bike. Well, what are you doing? Well, I want the bike. I'm going to take it. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> Next vignette, there's a black man. Now, I don't have to tell you what happens. What are you doing? I'm taking this bike. Is it yours? No. What are you doing? People calling 911, bringing out their cell phones, taking his picture. You stop that. You stop that. Next vignette, blonde woman. Once again, I don't mean to be trashing blonde people. Some of my best friends are blonde, so don't trip. <laughs> But there's an attractive blonde woman. What are you doing? Is that your bike? No. Why are you doing that? I want the bike. Not only do they not call the police, there will be men there with their wives or girlfriends, and they're going, can we help you? Can we help you clip that? <laughs> if I'm lying, I'm flying. So you see how people have different reactions to different circumstances. And if you ask those people, were they acting in a racist manner, they'd say, absolutely not. But once again, there are things outside of our level of consciousness that impact our decision making. Now, what are the ramifications in the criminal justice system? Well, who gets stopped? Uh, you don't seem like you belong in this neighborhood. We have a friend, an esteemed lawyer in the Bay Area, Ray Marshall. He lives in a very nice part of uh, the Bay Area called Piedmont, which I guess would be like Kenilworth, if Kenilworth is still up there, is it still nice? Okay. Um, and he was in his driveway. The police stopped him. Made, he was in his driveway with his wife and son. They made him get out of his own car in his own driveway. He's African American and explained what he was doing there. Why do we think that is? Um, who gets arrested? When juveniles are, are picked up, who gets uh, sent home with a warning? And who gets sent to juvenile hall? Who gets arrested? Who gets, who gets uh, becomes the victim of deadly force? We know what this is about. I don't need to tell you about Trayvon Martin. That was a horrible situation, but it put in people's consciousness the impact of being a young black man. Many of our friends will have the talk with their young black men about how you are to act when you are stopped by a police officer. I see not just black people shaking their heads, but all kinds of people here shaking their heads. That's wrong. That's real. That's America. It's all about associations, about what it means to be black and how dangerous you are. It goes to jury composition. We have people bounced off juries who are black because, well, they probably have somebody who's in jail, so they probably aren't going to convict. We have certain terrible prosecutors who use code words to prime the jury and the judge to think less of defendants of color. They use words like beast, he's a jungle, prey. And this actually primes people's minds to think of the black defendants as less than human with the uh, consequences that Ray was talking about in terms of over-incarceration. It even impacts the death penalty. Uh, the most important determiner of whether or not you're going to get the death penalty is whether or not your victim is white or African American. There's a whole other lecture I could give about the 14th Amendment, the intent standard, but I won't because I don't want the bottom to fall out here. Um, we were trained by um, people about this program, and they said it's not enough to just get up and kind of rail against bad things. We're supposed to be able to tell you what you can do. So what can we do? Two levels. On an individual level, any of you who have been in therapy, and you don't have to raise your hand or expose yourself, but you know that the first step in making meaningful, meaningful change is to have an awareness. So we must all be aware of the fact that many of us have these biases about all kinds of people, not just black people, Latinos, fat people, ball people. When I worked at the uh, uh, American Civil Liberties Union right after Northwestern, there was a study shown that ugly people get the death penalty more than people who are more attractive. You don't think about that, but the way you present yourself in society has an impact on what happens to you. So we are all biased and prejudiced. We need to just make sure that these biases do not adversely affect our individual decisions and that there are not societal ramifications of these biases. Um, there's a test called the IAT test, the Implicit Association Test. It was devised by Professor Mazarin Banaji. You can go to harvard.edu, put in IAT test. You can take a test. What it does is it shows you a white face and a black face, and they give a number of positive attributes, and you're supposed to connect those with the white faces, negative attributes, and connect those with the black faces. Then you reverse it. It's actually harder to connect 
positive attributes with black faces and negative attributes with white faces. And I wouldn't take the test for about five years because I went, I can't go in, up and talk and say I'm prejudiced against black people. What would happen to me? Luckily, when I finally took the test, the results were ambiguous, so that was very reassuring to me. But you can take this test, and then there's a professor named Patricia Devine from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she takes people, after you do the IAT test, through a 45-minute narrated, I want to be precise about this, 45-minute narrated interactive slideshow. It educates people about bias, it provides feedback, and teaches strategies about how to integrate the strategies into everyday life experiences so you can diminish your implicit bias. It takes a lot of work. It's not a one-shot thing. We all have it. We all have it. There's no shame. The last piece of this I would talk about is structural or societal change. I think it's very important to get these concepts into popular culture. I think people would be horrified to think that when they see my face, they think about, they have the same reaction as if they saw a snake or a spider. I think we're at a point in American society where people do not want to be racist. We have made progress, but we need to acknowledge that there are other things going on outside of our conscious perception that influence how we act. So I don't know if you ever saw the show King of the Hill, but uh, it's an animated show and there's a guy named Hank and he had a dog who bit the black post, post worker when he came into the yard. So Peg said, Hank, you're racist, you need to take the IAT test. Well, I was, we were just astounded, the IAT test on a cartoon. So Hank took the test, found out he was racist, and then a week later, a white postal worker came into the yard and the dog bit, the, it was the, the dog bit that person. The dog just didn't like postal workers. It had nothing to do with race. But it was interesting how these concepts got in. I love the show The Good Wife. I, I hope, oh dear, um, I have to stop. Um, it might be great to meet like a showrunner or somebody from that show because they're always doing interesting things. It would be important for law enforcement to keep records on who is stopped and what the race is because even though you may think you're not acting in a biased way, if the data indicate that you are acting in biased ways, this might give you a way to change things. Um, training is very, very important as well. The last thing I'll say is that today, the case of Fisher versus the University of Texas was argued at the United States Supreme Court. It's all about how to desegregate our colleges and universities. If you think back to the anecdote about Jamal and Lakeisha, you can imagine that some of those applications to schools and colleges are being subtly influenced by the names at the top of the applications, which is why many of us feel that race-conscious admission should be in place. Thank you for having me here. I've never worked so hard on a speech. I've wor wor I did eight drafts, because they said if you're over 15 minutes, you're toast. Um, also, these are complicated things to get out. They're disturbing concepts. But I think it's important that we enlighten ourselves, and I'm ultimately very hopeful. Thank you.